Welcome to The Brian Buffini Show, where we explore the mindsets, motivation, and methodologies of success. Here's your coach, Brian Buffini. Well, top of the morning to you, and welcome to The Brian Buffini Show. Today, I'm going to welcome back a longtime friend, but today we're going up market. John Gordon has spoken at dozens of Buffini and Company events and podcasts in the past. We like to say we're brothers from a different mother, but today we're, we're going up market because we have a newcomer today, which is his wonderful bride, Catherine. And we are going to dive in today onto the subject of relationship grit. And with everybody being in stay-at-home orders or quarantine, we know that a lot of marriages and relationships have had a lot of challenges in the last 12 months. So we thought this would be a great time to get together and talk with a fantastic couple who've learned a few things. And we're going to kind of roll up our sleeves and get into the content of relationship grit. You know, John has written over 20 books. He's all over the world as a best-selling author. But as I know myself, with my bride Beverly of 30 years, that the best sales presentation I ever made was to get her to marry me. And the best sales presentation I make every day is to have her stay married to me. And she's the rock on which I stand. And I know John has told me about you, Catherine, for many, many years. And so I'm delighted to meet you and I'm delighted to have you on the podcast today. I, I warn you ahead of time, he and I are very similar people. So you're kind of outnumbered today. So you're going to have to fight for your space. Okay. Okay. I love it. I love it. Thanks for having me on. Uh, this is great. Well, uh, again, I'm John Gordon's biggest fan and, and, and advocate, and so delighted that this work that I've read that I think is very timely, and as we were talking offline, inquiries to divorce attorneys in the last 12 months is up 34%. Relationships are having very difficult times. In fact, many in that profession, in family counseling and divorce procedures are saying the numbers would be even higher if people could afford to move out. And so uh, people are stuck together, maybe while they're stuck together or whether they're doing good, they can do better. I have a great marriage with my bride. You know what? But this last 12 months has been challenging for everybody. And uh, sometimes we get into bad habits and we start interacting in ways that, you know, we could do better when we're all going somewhere to work or travel or whatever else. So before we kind of dive into the content that I think is going to be life changing for some people today, I want to know this question. Where did you guys meet? Oh, I want to share that. So I was uh, walking down the street in Buckhead in Atlanta, Georgia. I had just had dinner with a girlfriend and there was some young guy standing in front of this new bar saying, hey, come in, check this place out. And I was like, yeah, maybe not. And he said, well, I'm having a party Friday night. Will you come? And I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, I was pretty much just blowing him off. But then he said, he looked right at me, he goes, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. And I thought, what a cheese ball. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And of course, I didn't show up Friday night. So, um, I'll and then take we it from there. But I, but, I, <laughs> but, I, but I meant it, Brian. I actually meant that. I looked into your eyes and I was just smitten right away. It was love at first sight yeah, for me, for her. Great. It took a few years for her, but for me, right away. And then a week later, she never came to the party, but a week later, I'm at the Best of Atlanta charity event and I saw her across the room. It was fate because never saw her before and now I saw her twice and I saw her walk across. I'm like, there she is. I was with my parents and I basically just beelined for her. She would tell me later that she was talking to some guy. I don't even remember her talking to some guy. Just I just saw over. her. You just bowled I, over. I, yeah, moved him right out of the way, stood right in front of her and I was just like, You've got to give me your card. Like, you didn't come back. I've got to have your card. I've got to have your number. I want to go out with you sometime. I want to take you out. She gave me a card, really just to get rid of me. Nice. She was not interested. Yeah. But she gave me a card, and that card became my calling card. I was calling her, asking yeah. her out. She yep. said no and no and no. And finally, she said yes, because we had a nice conversation. And then she kept canceling. Every time we had a date plan, she kept canceling. Finally, this last time, I said, look. You cancel it on me again. I said, either we go out tonight or we're never going out. I went all Long Island, New York. Oh, in that moment. boy. And um, she said, okay. And, and we went out and uh, it wasn't like, um, it wasn't magical or anything, but there wasn't a, probably even much of a connection at that point. <laughs> 
And and she went to visit Amelia Island, which is not far from Jacksonville, where we live now, yeah. in Ponte Vedra Beach. Sure. And so Amelia Island, she went there with some friends and she was trying to simplify her life. And she was eliminating the guys that she was going out with. Like, okay, I'm not going to go out with him. I'm done with this guy. Done with this guy. Because she was being flown all over the, the country and the world by these very successful guys. I wasn't even on the list that she made. Nice, Catherine. That's it. Keep them at the <laughs> Yeah, right. But, but she she came back and she called me for the first, like she said, she doesn't know to this day why. She literally picked up the phone and she wound up calling me. She's like, hey, I'm back. I'm like, I'm coming over. I went over. We talked about God all night. We literally talked about God in a very spiritual sense, had this amazing conversation, just in-depth talking. And that began the journey of our relationship, which is so strange that like she would come back and call me like that. What what year did you guys first meet? When did you guys start dating and when did you get married? Oh my gosh. We might we might um disagree on this. I think it was nineteen ninety four. Actually it was August nineteen ninety four that we met. Nice. Is that right, John? Or was yeah, it 95? It was, it was, yeah, it was 90, 94. And then I believe we got married. We got engaged like eight months later. Yeah. Right. And and then we got married like a year after that. That's great. It's similar to my own story. You know, I met Beverly in 1986. I've been in a serious motorcycle accident as a new immigrant to America. And the house I was renting a room in used to have the Bible study for the women's Olympic volleyball team. And oh, Beverly wow. Could. Beverly comes walking in. I like to tell people the first black person I ever met in my life, I married, you know, this growing up <laughs> in Ireland, you know, we didn't have a lot of racial diversity. I fell for her right away. And it took me three and a half years to get her to go out on a date with me. So John was even more successful than I was. I was on the program for three and a half years and then she agreed. And once I got her on the date, then it was all good. So that's it's good. Great. Stuff. Good yep. story. Very yeah. similar to ours. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that's and the same process. And we're, we're going to get down into that. We're going to talk a little bit of, about God and the relationship that plays in relationships today, certainly in my life and certainly seems in your guys' life as well. You guys have developed this acronym for healthier, more fulfilling relationships around an acronym, which is GRIT. Everybody's you know, interested in this term grit, it's used all the time. But for you, it's G-R-I-T. Give us the overview. Catherine, I want you to go first because the two talkers will dominate the conversation. Talk to me about yeah, the G, so the G, the R, the I, and the T. The G stands for God. Mm. And you have to bring God into your relationship. It mm. has to be the center of your relationship, right? So it's the triple braided cord. You, you can't break it. Right. So that was something when we did that in our relationship, it, it changed things. We, we, mm. we, we started our relationship uh, based on God, but it was in more of a spiritual way. We were more new age. And it was when we, when John, really when John became a Christian, that really, ch that changed everything. And so having God in, in your relationship, and we also came up with a prayer. And we say that prayer every single night. That's great. All yeah. these years later. Well, it's interesting. On our podcast, we've had Les Parrott. I don't know if you guys know the Parrots at all. They're an amazing couple. And they wrote, you know, Save Your Marriage Before It Starts. They were the people who were the creators of the marriage matching formula inside eHarmony. So basically, eHarmony is built on what the Parrots created. And th their passion was they were seeing divorces at 50 plus percent and so on and so forth. And they just thought, this is a devastation for everybody. How can we help do this? And you guys may not be aware of this, but in the eHarmony dynamic, they have, you know, a three to 4% divorce rate of people who get married. Oh, um, wow. It's extraordinary. And the number one matching science that's used in this is connecting people around their relationship with God. And wow. so many, many people have no idea that with eHarmony. I never knew that. Okay, yeah, that's parity, really fantastic. fascinating. Yeah, Les, wow. Les and Leslie Parrott, if you ever get a chance. We did episode 235 with Les Parrott. And again, so here you guys are. You guys came to this intuitively. You came to this through experience. And there's an example of it being validated through science and the largest relationship matching engine in the world. So that that's, validates it. That's fantastic. And what about the R, Kathy? Come on, let's hear it. And the R is resolve. You nice. have to resolve to stick together. You know, it's so easy to give up and walk away. But, you know, it's, it's like I always say, if you don't get it right in this relationship, you're going to have to try again in the next one. And if you yeah. don't get it right in that one, you know, no matter where you go, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. So My mother was big on that. Stay where you are. Resolve to make it work. 
make, you know, work on the relationship. Well, I grew up in a country in Ireland where divorce wasn't legal. OK, now oh, wow. some people say that's also why there's a lot of drinking. So I never heard the word divorce growing up and it was never a conversation. It's not in our 30 years married and 35 years knowing each other. We've never used that word. And I think we talk about the power of a made up mind and so on and so forth. And so many people, because it's in their DNA, because they've come from a, a, a family that had a divorce that they do it. I, I'll tell you a story. And John, you probably have hundreds of these, but I had a guy come up to me at a seminar one day, right? And the receiving line at the end, and we've done hundreds of times in our career. And this guy <laughs> walked up to me and he was a big time guy in our, in our real estate space. Okay. He owned big brokerages and so on and so forth. And he talks to me and he goes, you know, I've been married five times. He said, I keep marrying the wrong woman. <laughs> Boy, I, I had some fun with this guy. I asked him a lot of questions, you know. But at the end of the day, he kept marrying the same person. They all looked alike. They all sounded alike and so on and so forth. And I go, you know, my bride, Beverly, when we were first married, she put a sticker on the mirror for both of us in our bathroom mirror. And it said, you are now looking at the problem. Okay. So <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> so give me the I. I, I God, resolve. What's the I? Invest. You mm. have to invest in the relationship. So it's we before me. Don't mm. be a consumer, be an investor. Mm. So, you know, when we started to invest in our marriage, everything started to change. Everything, I mean, it, we really started to prosper. So it was about investing. So invest in the time, investing the energy, invest in the goodwill, serving each other, putting the other person first. That's the magic. Give me the tea before we move on. The T is together. You have to do it together. Mm. You know, it can't just be one, one person that wants to make it work. It has to be two. And sometimes it's not at the same time, mm. but ultimately, yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes one gives more than the other, mm. but you really do both have to want it. So mm. together. That's awesome. John, as I look at this, you guys have obviously had a ton of feedback. You've, you've done this book, you put it out there in the marketplace. You know, as you hear more and more challenges out there in the marketplace, it's got to drive you back more and more to these principles inside your own marriage. But what do you see as the single biggest challenges that are being experienced in the modern marriage today? I think right now we are seeing a lot of separation in terms of division. You know, there's fear, a lot of division. Fear, mm. fear. also yeah. fear. <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, being created by fear. Mm. Catherine, talk about the fear and talk about the division. You do it so well. <laughs> I'm just saying, because because that's it. I think what I'm finding as I'm talking to a lot of couples now is fear of the unknown. And, and, and then it even boils down to as basic as, am I going to be able to provide for my family? Is she going to think less of me of a ma as a man if I can't take care of them? You know, just basic needs, but it, it, it coming out of fear, you know, fear of not being able to meet those. You know, it's interesting you talk about that. You know, my bride is, you know, I know her 30 years. She's an Olympic athlete. You know, she's a Hall of Fame volleyball player for the University of Tennessee, has all these accolades and whatever else. But lately, we've been having discussions. And I have, in my 35 years, knowing Beverly, 30 years married, you know, I've been asking her, and, she, and, and quite candidly, you know, she's watching what's going on culturally and what's happening in our society. And, and certain erosions of certain freedoms and dynamics of how our society has functioned. And it's brought up for her a lot of fears uh, and other fears. I'll be honest, we have a pretty special relationship and we've raised six kids and, we've, you know, I'm a very blessed man. And lately, you know, it's funny. I said to her about a month ago, I go, honey, are we okay? I said, you know, I, I know I take a lot of grace to live with, but am I Am I stepping on toes more than I normally, am I saying things, you know, we just seem a little out of sorts. And it took some digging and it took some time. I started making a commitment. I'm like, John, I go for my walk on the beach and I say, well, let's us go for the walk on the beach. Yeah. And she has a, she has a, a knee problem from the 20 million Athlete. jumps she's done in her yeah. life. So I'm not going as far as I used to go and whatever else, but we go for a walk on the beach. And during these discussions, lo and behold, kind of unknown to her, her fears were more for her children and her grandchildren. What kind of country are we becoming? What's going on with our society? The racial divisions, the things that she's watching on the news or the government impositions and things like that that we're experiencing. And all of a sudden, it was showing up as something I had never experienced in our relationship where I felt she was kind of short with me or am I in the doghouse? And it turned out it had nothing, it, well, I'm sure it had something to do with me, but it, it didn't have much to do with me. It was a fear Right. that I had to go digging for. And by the way, that she had to go digging for. And we did it by kind of, by doing the T, by going together and invest in the time 
we kind of got to some things there and so you know what people are it's okay you, you know it's okay to be a little fearful right now it's okay to be a little anxious right now and also for me to kind of guide her through that process of where i think things are going to work out and where i think things can remake themselves but so it's interesting you bring up fear and john i, I think the consequences of the fear can create the separation and i'd love your take on that so what you did is so important because a lot of times when that happens couples pull away from each other mm-hmm. they don't move towards each other so you did what we talk about in the book, the four C's. Mm. You communicated, which is essential. You must communicate because where there's a void in communication, negativity will fill it. So you were having this little void. You were thinking, hey, is she okay with me? Am I being you know, uh, too upset right now? Is she feeling my energy in a certain way? So you talked about it and that brought you two together. But then you didn't just communicate, you connected. Mm. It's important to take the time to connect. Catherine and I will connect a lot. And a lot of couples are not connecting, right? Think about what happens. Fear sets in, uncertainty. They pull away. They start going in their own directions. They don't communicate. The voids happen. Negativity starts to fill it. Now they feel disconnected and they don't take the time to connect more. So the key is now you have to make the time to connect. Catherine and I, same thing. We'd go on walks together. We would talk about our fears. We would talk about, hey, what should we stand for right now? What should we focus on? What message do we need to share to help people through this time? You know, Brian, someone the other day, you know, said to me on Twitter that, you know, John, it doesn't seem like, you know, you're, you're trying to help struggling restaurant workers. Don't you care about the loss of life? I said, of course I care about the loss of life. I care about every life. My focus though, is to help those who are living right now And we have to help. We're so focused on death that we're not focused on life and living and the people struggling and the mental health. So I'm like, of course I'm focused on life. So, so Kath and I would talk about that and talk about who we need to help and focus on the living and focusing on our life and our marriage and helping others. So we really got to the core of, of connecting. I I want to throw this in for, I want to throw this in for a sec though, John, because one of the dynamics that's unusual in the context today is people feel like they're connected. If they're in New York or San Francisco or LA, they're in an apartment together. They're, they're in the house together. They're working from home, schooling from home. So they're around each other more than ever before, which obviously creates opportunities for some grist. There's also more stress. But I think the people have the illusion that they're connecting because they're seeing each other all the time. As you and I both, we've spent a lot of time on the road traveling. And I spent my whole career, you know me, from the day I met you, I said, John, I'm on a mission to get you home. From the first time we ever met in 2007, I said, being a speaker, being audience is loving you, but there's nothing like being home. And I championed you from day one. Now, here's the thing. I've been doing that for 20 years. And lately, Bev's like, hey, don't you have somewhere to go and speak? You know? <laughs> I mean, no. But the, the dynamic is, that, so as you talk about the four C's, I think the illusion that we're connecting, you know, I have to get out of the house with my bride to connect, to go have a talk. It's the walk, you know, whatever else. So I think that's that's a big one. Let, let's dive some more in. You got two more C's. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Catherine. well, before that, I just want to say that's one of the things we say is we actually say you have to walk it out to talk it out. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times that's when our, I mean, sometimes we'll go on our walks and we'll fight. Mm-hmm. And then, but by the end of the walk, we've worked through it. So yeah, you're you're right about that. I didn't even think about it like that. You're in the house all the time. You think you're, together, but you're really not. It's about taking that one-on-one time. Yeah. Yeah. And I asked asked Catherine uh, a few months ago (laughs) on a scale of one to 10, how much you'd like to be married to me? And she said, pre-COVID or now? (laughs) Right. No doubt. It's an unusual circumstance. And, you know, it's made lifelong partners, roommates, uh, uh, workmates, you know, like my bride, I don't know what Beverly thought I did before, but like, I'll be on Zooms and you know, this and any other. And I've got meetings. I, we, we just signed a, the biggest deal in our company's history with the National Association of Realtors and this and any other. Wow. I'm, on the, I'm on these meetings for hours and hours. And she's like, hey, you know, the guy's here to change out the lights outside. What's going Why can't you meet with him? I go, well, I got the, I got the CEO of the National Association of Realtors on the Zoom call right now. I, in fact, I have him on mute while we're talking right now, babe. You know, so, you know, you got the, we got the kids. We have six kids. All of them came home. All are doing college online. You know, all of a sudden, now, again, thankfully, we have big home. Not everybody's in that spot. But you, you think you're communicating and you think you're connecting, but, but maybe you're not. COVID and a is, lot of times, couples don't know how to communicate and mm. they never have, right? So they never really 
got down to their feelings and talked about their issues and talked about their challenges and talked about their fears. So that's what we talk about in the book. Like you got to bring it out into the open. We actually created a free action plan for couples to do with the book. So that way they can actually do this action plan, enhance their communication. And again, if you need to go to therapy or counseling, we encourage that. Like that will help a lot of couples. This will begin the process of communication. But if you need someone to guide you and help you through that process, we recommend it because a lot of times people don't know how to communicate. Where can we get that free action plan, John? Oh, relationshipgritbook.com. Relationshipgritbook.com for the free action plan. And uh, we go through communication connection. And then there's commitment Mm. where you have to commit to each other during this time. Like instead of going into self-preservation mode where I just have to survive, it's about how can I serve you? Uh How can I help you? How can I commit to you? What can I do for you? And it's easy when we're busy and stressed to go in self-preservation mode, but we know we're at our best when we focus on we, not me. And that's something, again, we we have to work on. Catherine was always so giving always so supportive. I'm sure you as well. You've are, you're on the road. I was on the road. Come home, right? Catherine was there for me. She was busy with the kids, serving, sacrificing with those kids. We had it a lot easier being on the road, but then you come home. We called it the, en- the uh, re-entry period, right? the turbulence that comes in when you'd actually yeah. walk in the door and you know it would be like so hard those first- Well, they get used to living without us and making decisions. And now you come home and you have an right. opinion on something. It's like, hey, we, we, <laughs> you know, this all works when you're not gone. And now you want right. to get on the merry-go-round and you have an opinion on things. By the way, you're leaving. <laughs> you know? it was, it's hard, right? Yeah. yeah, you come in and then you're leaving yeah. and you don't really feel like- um, you're as engaged. And when you start to get engaged, you have to leave again. Which is why the vast majority of people in the public speaking business have been divorced many, many times over. Oh, wow. And there's only there's only a couple of us. There's only a couple of us. That are- is that why you're so adamant about me spending more time at home? And I have to tell you, Brian, if it wasn't for you, we would never have the Power of Positive Leadership training program. We've trained hundreds of leaders now, oh, thousands of leaders, hundreds of trainers we even have because of you. Because you encourage us to do that. Well, and you know, because good things happen. Good things happen when you're in that environment and in the space. You're trying to do the best for your family, but ultimately long-term separation doesn't help. You know, you talk about commitment. One of the things that's happened for me in COVID is I was a pretty good golfer years ago. I was about a one handicap for about 10 years. And then as the kids started coming, kids are in sports. Every one of my kids, as you know, they're, one is pursuing the Olympics and one was a college football player. And then I have four college volleyball players. So I'm at games, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm traveling, I come home. So the one thing that had to go was a game of golf. I mean, it was an easy decision for me. You know, imagine I'm gone all the time and then I'm home Saturday and I'm five or six hours on the golf course with the guys. So I went like playing once or twice a year for years. And then we had a house fire in 2007. I didn't play for several years. So I started playing. I'm in a club right here in, in Carlsbad and I'm playing in this men's group the other day. So they're all sitting around, the kind of guys are standing out and they're having a beer and we're socially distanced, like 20 guys, you know? And this one guy says, you're a kind of an odd guy to play golf with. And I go, okay. He goes, you hit shots like a pro that I, no one in this group can hit. And then you hit shots like a beginner. And I go, yeah, well, I just haven't played. And so that's why I'm here. He said, well, what's your handicap? Because we're trying to play in these tournaments now. And I said, well, I was a one, but, uh, you know, but now I'd be doing well to break 80. And the guy goes, that, that's kind of hard for us to know. He goes, how did that happen? So I told him about the kids and so on and so forth. And he says to me, Oh, I could never do that. And the guy next to him says, I could never do that. So then I, you know, and it's all guys standing around, they're drinking beer and telling jokes. So I asked the one guy, well, let me ask you, how long have you been married? He goes, well, I was married 18 years and that, 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 and then, you know, got divorced. The, the, the other guy who commented, well, I was married uh, 20 years and then I got divorced. I went around the, the whole group. I was the only guy in the whole group who had never been divorced out of 12 or 13 guys. And, it, you know, it kind of got, we went from a fun kind of jocular conversation to all these guys. You could tell the regret swelling up in them. And then one guy saved the conversation because he said, well, how'd you do it? And I said to him, which I think fills into the third C, as I said, when I got married, I realized my life was no longer my own. My life belonged to my family, my wife and my kids, and that that would be my life. And I said to him, hitting a golf ball, 320 yards is never going to replace the joy that I get of any of the small little moments of my wife and kids that are a joy to me. So I go, it's just about a reprioritization. So I said, I made a commitment when I got married, my life was no longer my own. 
I'll have to send this podcast to these guys. They're all listening in. So, <laughs> so Brian, I, I have a question for you. Did you learn that? Was that modeled for you or what made you make that decision? Oh, well, let's. And so here's the blessing, right? My my mom and dad are married 62 years, you know, living in the same little house in Ireland. They never had money. They never had this. They had that. But they were committed. My father-in-law and mother-in-law, they're married 60 years. So I did have good examples. And so that I know that's a rarity and that's a blessing, but I got to see it modeled. And so for me, my mindset was always, I was going to take time. Like you didn't go out with him right away. Okay. That's a great lesson for young ladies. You know, you, you wouldn't go see him right away. You made the connection and so on and so forth. I took my time. You know, even though I knew Beverly was one for me, it took time. We took our time. We made the commitment because you know what? I was going to measure twice, three times, four times before I cut. And then once we got married, I was all in and I've been all in ever since. And um, I'm looking for the joy. I'm looking for the blessing uh, every day with my bride, as opposed to keeping a list of wrongs, keeping a list of shortcomings, keeping a list of you said this, you know, you always do that. You know, those are words not allowed in our house. You always, you know, it's the same thing. You know, we're on the same page. I read the book and I went, yeah, I, I yep, 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 yep. This is great. So we have well, well Catherine always says don't keep score, right? right? If you keep if you if you keep score, the relationship doesn't win. So you yeah. have to make sure that you're not keeping score. But I also think we need to recognize again the commitment that you know our, our wives make mm -hmm. in in the relationship. It's like you have to give. I think about Catherine, like she was so committed for so long, and I wasn't as committed early on. I was committed to getting out there, speaking, providing in that way, which I had to do. And she supported that. She wasn't the wife that said, oh no, be here with me. She was like, you go, you go do this work. I got this. Like I would not be who I am today if it wasn't for her commitment, her sacrifice. And later on though, I had to really learn commitment mm. to her and to make sure that when I was home, I was putting my family first. I was putting her first. Early on, Brian, 30, 31 years old, 32, 33, I was not a good husband. I was not a good father. I was literally just trying to make it self-focused. I wasn't a person of faith. And that's what we share in the book, the story of how I changed in a lot of ways, became a person of faith, started to focus more on my wife. I learned that commitment. I came from a divorced family. So my biological father wasn't committed. My dad who raised me was very committed. So I saw he and my mom together for commitment. Catherine comes from both parents, stayed together for a long time, but they weren't happily married. Mm. So we don't want people to stay together just to grit it out mm. and with clenched fists and we're going to stick together and be miserable. This is about how do you stay together and make it meaningful and special and more loving and more joyful, right, Catherine? Well, let me jump in on something you just said, John, because I think this is, this is a big deal for men, which is not a lot of men venture into these subjects. I mean, daytime TV and there's a whole bunch of books and lined up the women, their romance novels, 98% purchased by women. You know, the women are, are very relationally focused and more connected on that. Now, when I read the Bible, here's what it says. My responsibility is for the love relationship in the marriage. And my wife is supposed to have responsive love for me. As the words are written in Greek, the agape, the God-given love is supposed to come from me to my wife. And my wife is supposed to respond to that. So she loves, she loves me because I love her. And so when I read the Bible, it says the onus of responsibility for the love relationship in the marriage is on me. And the dynamic there that's interesting, what, what we want to do is provide. I'm going off to work. I'm going to hunt. I'm going to chop down the trees. I'm going to do the seminars. You know how hard I'm working for this family. And they, where, by the way, do you, who's keeping the lights on? You know how funny roads and nights I was on the road. And you know how much that costs and what's the deal. And I had three nights on the road. And the, whatever. That's the role we're comfortable in. We're not comfortable in the leading the love relationship in the marriage. And that's really, we have to step outside ourselves. I just think this, I think women know we're naturally so inept at this, that any effort we make at all, they just cheer us on enormously. And Catherine, I love your take on that, but I just feel like when I make all these efforts for my bride, like I'll do a week of flowers. My wife loves flowers. Have a memorable Monday. Have a terrific Tuesday. Have a wonderful Wednesday. You are tremendous on Thursdays. And, and uh, let's have a fabulous Friday. And I'll just boom, 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 boom. They'll show up every day. And when I do things like that or I communicate, I'm big on doing things. My wife needs to hear words. So when I, I write the note, the extra note with the flowers, when I do that, and my wife just so appreciates it because she knows I have to think about it. And I, 
I wonder if, if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, that what John does for well, me. Well, yeah, just what? that when he makes the effort, when he makes the effort to cultivate oh, the love goodness. and the relationship, you, you, you appreciate it. it. Yeah. I love it. Well, I'm just going to share this. So, you know, and we share it in the book. John had a, a spell where he wasn't uh, faithful early in our marriage. I, you know, we had young kids and he was looking, you know, looking for attention outside the marriage and ended up, you know, becoming a Christian and, and we, you know, everything was great. And then we were walking on the beach one time and I was sharing with him my, you know, uh, sadness about just hearing about a couple of our friends getting divorced. And then he ends up saying, I have something to tell you. And he ends up telling me about these infidelities. And he said, you know, really, he didn't have to do it, but he just felt like it was the one thing. And they were 12 years you know, back. Mm -hmm. But he said it was, he just felt like it was keeping us, keeping something between us. When I was 30, Brian. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he always liked that. But my point is, is I did want to talk to him. I was done with him. And of course, I wanted to punish him and I wanted him to uh, feel the same way I did. So I, I was going to go cheat on him, but and God had other plans. So, um, what he did during that time, and I'm not saying that it has to be in this situation to do it, but I'm telling you, it changed my heart. He left notes all over the house every day. He, he, he would, would sit, sit and, and just pray. He just kept doing it, and he, but he didn't stop. It wasn't like he got angry because I wasn't reciprocating because I wasn't. Uh -huh. I mean, this went on for months. But the one thing that he did was to leave these notes. Now, it's not the same way in that you're telling it, but, but I have to say, <laughs> I know, I just, where did I go with that, John? <laughs> hey, hey, honey, like, Brian was just talking about these great notes that he leaves every week, and let's just go back to, you like, know, the worst you moment know of my life. Yeah, and you know what? Here's the great thing. Here's the great thing, is uh, what I find is in my work is that people can't identify with the guy that has the Learjet or the big business or all that stuff, but they can't identify with the struggles and the mistakes and the missteps. Uh, you know, I, there's too many of the motivational crap speakers out there that never had a bad day in their life. Every day is positive. Every day is fantastic. They've never had a down day. They've never had a, ma a misstep. And that's why, you know, John Gordon is known as this ferociously positive human being. Therefore, in the modern parlance, never made a mistake, doesn't have bad thoughts, doesn't get anxious, doesn't get fearful, doesn't get frustrated, doesn't, you know, doesn't get snippy with his wife, doesn't get anxious. Like that's, that's what the conclusions are drawn. And so here, here's what this is. When you guys share this story and share the dynamic and share the how-tos, I, I think it's for all of us, it's the most, probably the devastating mistake we can make to lose our wife's heart. And the great hope is that you can win your wife's heart back. And that's I mean, my point. And he yeah. did. Mm -hmm. And, and, and he still does that. He writes love notes and, and just, just constantly just, and complimenting. He all, it always is complimenting, you know, that never stops. So it, it is those little things that he does. <laughs> I didn't mean to go south with that, but, no, it's awesome. but you're right. Because, you know, it's the same thing that John says about how he can write these books. He doesn't write these books because he's naturally positive. Yeah. I'm the positive one in the family. <laughs> he is the one that has, you know, he really, he has struggled with sure. that for years. And it was in writing the books that helped him help yeah. himself be more positive. Well, out of your pain comes your passion. And here's the deal with him. Our very first conversation we ever had in depth, this subject came up. He was transparent with me because I was, I was championing him and I was championing him as, as a father and a husband and as a guy in the speaking business. And we, we went there in, our, in one of our very first ever in-depth conversations. I, I was like, man, I think me and this guy are going to be friends a long time. But because his heart was, I want to be God's man. I want to live a good life. You know, I've made mistakes. You know, how do I do this business that's taken off? And I've written these books that have touched people's hearts all over the world. How can I honor that commitment and that calling? And yet at the same time, be the man I'm supposed to be for my wife and kids. That was kind of our first ever conversation, and that's why it turned into things like the training programs and so on and so forth. So it's, it's magical stuff, and it, it serves a lot of people. We have a few minutes left. Uh, John's got a commitment with the NFL he's got to keep. What are the, what's the fourth C? I feel like I'm, I'm hanging on the trailer. Who shot JR? We got commitment, connection, communication. What have we, what's the last one? 
Well, you have to show that you care. And that care is what makes a great relationship. That's everything. So if you if you don't care, people won't know you care. They won't feel it. They won't know it. They won't sense it. So it's all about caring. You know, us talking about this right now, we share it in the book. So this is not something like that's just coming out in the talk. We were very transparent in the book, talking about my mistakes, talking about what I did wrong, talking about how Catherine forgave me years later when I told her. I am 49 years old, about to be 50 now, right? And so we're still we still have this thing that happened when I was way younger in our marriage early on when I'm a different person at that point. But at the same time, we knew we needed to tell that story because we care about others because we care about other people's marriages and we know other people are going through struggles. So if we don't show that we care by being honest and being truthful about who we are, we can't help other couples. We can't help other men. We can't help other women. So I think Caring is extending yourself. It's demonstrating commitment. It's it's showing that other people matter. And so it's those little things. You send flowers. I write notes. Other people cook. In my family, food and love was one and the same <laughs> yeah, growing right. up with my mom. Same right? with my mom. Jewish, Italian family, a lot of food, a lot of guilt. Yeah. <laughs> and so there are different ways that you show that you care, right? And so so, so each person has their own caring trademark. Catherine always compliments me, makes me feel like I'm... I'm I'm the king of of the world. Gives me the confidence to go out and take on the world. And that's how she shows that she cares. She believes in me more than I believe in myself. Every time we've gotten to the next step in our life, I'm like, you sure we're going to be okay? You sure we should do this? She's like, yes, let's go for it. We can do this. And so she's been that champion. And she cares. And that care is what bonds you two together. It's what makes a strong relationship. And it's what's key to a marriage. So you got to communicate. You got to make sure you're connecting. You got to have that greater commitment for each other. And you got to show that you care. That's beautiful stuff. You know, I think one of the things it's easy to struggle with is we can show care for people outside the home and forget to put the people in, inside the home first. You know, we, yeah. we serve these people and help these people and give these people and love on these people. And, you know, they always say put the oxygen mask on yourself first, right, before the ones you love. And sometimes we forget that. And I think that's you know, especially coming out of this environment where we've been, we can we can be sending notes and encouraging people outside of our home and forget to do it inside our home because uh, they're there all the time and we're there all the time. And I just think this message is very, very powerful. It's very, very important. It's very, very real. You know, you and I, John, are around the speaking and the book business and, you know, there's just an awful lot of fluff out there. And I, I don't mean to drive it down but just as a guy who grew up on the classics, on the guys who grew up meeting Zig Ziglar and Jim Rohn and, you know, Nito Cobain and Les Brown and just, uh, just all the great public speakers that were out there. And today it's a lot of pop psychology. They were on The Apprentice on Tuesday. Their book comes out on Thursday. And they, you know, they're, they're on the Good Morning America show or whatever else. And, you know, I, I, I personally sat on a panel with a gal one time who wrote a best-selling book about how to buy your first home. And from the proceeds of the book, she bought her first home. You know, and and there's a lot of that stuff in relationships and so on and so forth. And this is the real deal. It's a gritty book about a gritty subject that ultimately is the essence of everything. And I appreciate you guys doing it. I appreciate you guys being so transparent in in the book and here today. I think it is a blessing. And I'm going to encourage everybody to go and get relationship grit wherever books are sold. You got God, resolve, invest, and be together and learn those four C's. And, uh, you know what? Life is good. I think human beings do better together. We do better together. We're designed to be in relationship. And sometimes we fail in these relationships because we didn't have the modeling, or we don't have the tools, or we didn't have the know-how, or we thought we were the only one to make a mistake like that. It's good to know we're all human. We all make mistakes, but there's help for us. So I appreciate you guys both. Catherine, it's fantastic to meet you at last. I, I've known this lad so long, and but I always knew I always knew there was something behind him. I always <laughs> knew. I always knew um, there was. And I, I can't wait to meet your wife. I've heard oh. so much about her and, and you. I can't wait to meet you in person. So, you know, maybe we need to take a trip down to San Diego when we're in L.A. next time. You bet. Lou Holtz used to say about his wife, his wife just passed recently, and Lou and I have great friends. And he said, I used to pray for her, now I pray to her. You know, it's like, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a good philosophy for any guy. So. Hey, I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. Congratulations on all your success. I hope the book continues and continues and continues. It's needed right now more than ever. And as we're coming out of these restrictions and pandemics and more and more people are opening up the culture, I think there's going to be some damage done in our primary relationships 
and maybe some people can put some stuff together. Can Catherine just share a couple of tips for the women oh, listening? Oh, no, that's great because you, you have some fantastic tips at the end of the I book. Think she so. should, yeah, I, think she, I think she could share some of her tips that would really help some of the women listening. All right, Catherine, you go. Yeah, well, I'll just share two that I, that I love and I live by. And one of them is compliment your mate. Mm -hmm. You know, let the best thing they hear about themselves come from you. Mm -hmm. How many times are you with a friend when they're, you know, always bad mouthing their husband or bad, you know, or, or to their face? You know, what are you wearing? What are you doing? And so start giving them compliments when John was traveling a lot, you know, and I was home and it was really hard uh, with the kids. It was a hard time um, trying to run them all over to different sports. And he would walk in the door with his handsome suit and he was clean looking and, you know, on his way out to his first class flight. And I wanted to cut him down. You know, I wanted to say something mean, but I didn't. I would just end up giving it. And the more I did it, it was like a muscle that started to strengthen. And what I noticed is when I would compliment him, his face would light up. So that's one big thing I always say, compliment your partner, compliment them. And the other one is don't compete. Mm. I see that a lot. I see couples competing. You know, if one ends up losing weight, but the other one needs to lose it, they don't. They don't like that. They want to keep them down. You know, they're, again, it's fear, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they, you know, they want to keep them where they are. So don't compete. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, and by the way, you just, you know, I thought he used to fly Southwest Airlines according to his talk. So that's good to know. He used to, he, <laughs> he's getting dressed up for that first class flight. That's good to know. Well, Listen. that happened later on in his career. Yeah, I, know, I know, <laughs> That wasn't happening in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the Irishman. I got to take it in there. Listen, here's the deal. For the rest of the tips, get the book, read the book, and maybe get it together as a couple and uh, read it together. Go for a walk and walk and talk it out. That'd be good stuff. And maybe what we'll do is this. I'll have you guys send emails to us and we'll forward them on to the Gordons so they can hear about their impact, how they've blessed your life and blessed your relationship. And uh, you guys have been a blessing to me for a long time and uh, a blessing to a whole bunch of people on this podcast today. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate you so much. God bless. And uh, a person who's been uh, a model for me for uh, my whole life in regards to the grit and the gritty relationship that she has with my dad is my mom, Therese, who's going to leave us today with an Irish blessing. So over to you, Mom. May the road rise up to meet you, and may the wind always be at your back. May the rain fall soft upon your fields, and the sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. See you next time. Thank you.